welcome to the Forward Unto Dawn podcast, the show about the lore and universe of the Halo franchise. This is episode number 44, recorded November 13th, 2021. I am David, and I'm joined by my usual co-host, Danny. Hey, Lee, hello. And we've got a guest, uh, Def Guru. Howdy ho. Def, it's been a while since you were on the podcast, uh, by my reckoning. Episode 27 way back in 2019, talking about Halo Bad Blood. So why don't you introduce yourself again? I am am especially uninteresting. I am the moderator of um, Our Halo, Our Halo Story, and Our Halo Wars on uh, Reddit. Uh, I spend far too much time thinking and arguing online about Halo. That's most of my life story. Uh, So we have convened today to talk about the latest Halo novel that came out, uh, Troy Denning's Halo Divine Wind, uh, which came out October 19th, 2021. Uh, and it's uh, the latest installment in the Ferret Team saga series that started way back in a while now. Uh, the Ferret Team's popped up a couple of times from Halo Last Light, a uh, short story in Halo Fractures, 2017's Halo Retribution. Uh, and this also sort of is a sequel to plot stuff that happened in 2020's Halo Shadows of Reach. So it's a, a, it's really the next installment in the, the Denning verse, uh, that we've gotten since Troy Denning is basically doing most of the novels now himself. It seems to be split between him and Kelly Gay pretty much. Yeah. She's doing the, she's batter up. Uh, we're going to get something from her soon ish. Uh, but mostly the Denning show these days. And I guess before we we break into the spoilery stuff, uh, what did people think about the book at a high level? I thought it was a a mass of just random Halo encounters (laughs) and page form and word form. It was it was a shoddy, confusing mess for a book. Didn't like it. Thought it was a complete waste of my time. Oh, that's interesting. I think I think my impression was a, a lot more positive. I, I generally, I, do you tend to like Denning's books? I I persisted through them. I do. I, I I've read quite a lot of Halo books on that. This is not exactly my my first Halo book, so no, it's a it's a it's a good Halo book, but it's a it's a terrible book, a terrible 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 story in general. <laughs> if you ignore the uh, if you ignore everything about it, but as a Halo book, it's pretty good. Well, I haven't really thought of where it lays in uh, the grander scale of literature but in terms of halo books like yeah i i thought it was pretty good i i i i'm gen, i'm generally really a fan of uh denning's work so my first thought of this was uh i thought maybe this could maybe be a top five halo book for me but uh i don't know that could have just been the high at the time but i still think it's probably up there for me personally yeah i guess once again i'm in the medium it's, it's it's been a while since we had really salty Danny about something. So, ooh, excitement, viewers. Um, yeah, damn right. It's definitely. I do think this is very much a a Denning book. I would say at this point, one of the defining traits of a, a Denning book is that you have a bunch of different factions all after something or at cross purposes, and they get thrown together. And there's sort of a Benny Hill setup <laughs> where you aren't entirely sure who is chasing who or who is setting a trap uh-huh. for who. Or, yeah. Um, and depending on how much you like that, uh, that will impact your enjoyment of the book. Uh, but there's lots of like role reversals and, oh, like smash cut to this. Someone's made a huge mistake on stuff like that. I do think the strength of his his book and his characters especially is that pretty much nothing happens because people are idiots in Denning's books they are absolutely characters on their own um and here we've got basically kind of like five or six different uh factions or motivations going on and colliding in this book um, and as mentioned it's sort of a follow up to both the ferret team stuff uh, directly, but also story threads uh, that were set up in Halo Shadows of Reach and that tie into Halo Infinite. Um, so, yeah, why don't we just dive immediately in? Um, because this does start 
within basically hours um, immediately after Shadows of Reach, uh, which in that book, there was all the blue stuff happening on Reach, but there were also the Keepers of the One Freedom, uh, our favorite. The Halos and the Forerunners are still divine uh, guys out there led by Caster. Um, and basically, one of the things uh, I do like about this book is that you definitely get the sense of sort of Caster's desperation and his dwindling options because he's built up as a reasonable faction on his own. Um, but then he's he's slumming it with the Banished at this point. Uh, and at the beginning of this book, basically all his followers fit on a single transport. Um, that's all he's got left. And the thing he doesn't know is that three of the keepers, or four, I should say, are actually just a ferret team, UNSC moles, who have been uh, with him for a long time. Um, and they, after the events of Shadows of Reach, they're off to head to the Ark to light the halos. Uh, we get perhaps the most... As you do. Yeah, as you do. Uh, it's not a very original plan, but we know it'll work. Uh, and we get some... There's some interesting stuff in this early part. There's some really, I kind of glazed over, timey-wimey slip space discussion stuff uh, about like how someone can target target their ship as it leaves the portal when they're still in the portal and stuff like that. I found it funny, and I know that like over the past few years, they've kind of been doing away with every Brute's an idiot with people like Atriox or Caster, but it's still funny hearing Brute's like talk about the intricacies of slip, slip space travel. Yeah, they're not they're not dumb apes, and especially in Denning's uh, book, they are not dumb. Um, also along for the ride is uh, Islan Gadugai. I, it's terrible, terrible names to ever. The only good thing if you listen to the audiobooks, I guess, is you figure out how to say these people's names. But the the elite, the former uh, assassin, Silas Shadow guy, along for the ride, basically because he was put in a situation where he either dies or betrays Atriox and then dies. Um, so he's he's one of the, the sort of like extra purposes here because he certainly doesn't believe in the Forerunners are gods and... Uh, but he has a, a personal loyalty uh, to Caster, which plays in a lot throughout this. Um, other details are that we get, and this I think is the first explicit um, declaration of this, is that they specifically believe that the great journey will kill the unbelievers. Um, it's not just, oh, it'll sweep the the worthy to godhood, but it will kill everybody else. Is um, that um, is that like a specific, unique variation on the belief, unique to this group? Or well, yeah, that's it's unclear. It does. Uh, this book does tie in. Uh, we'll get a little into it a little bit later. It does tie into answering some of the questions people have had since Halo Three, uh, with regards to what Truth knew and when did he know it. Um, if he was, as some believed during Halo 3, ready to nuke the universe, um, or if he really thought that he would become a god. Um, spoiler, it's the latter. So there's a uh, vindication for our uh, character study that Grim really loved, The Shroud, which we'll link in the show notes. It was very interesting Interesting reading some of that, considering all the de- considering all the debates I've had online regarding what truth was all about or wasn't about in Halo 3. It's funny to have all this now. Yeah, but we get introduced on the Phantom to a bunch of other uh, characters. Um, there's Krellis, uh, who's the pilot. Um, he was uh, dear old Orson's kid, one of uh, Caster's right-hand men back in the day. He's been gone. Uh, Fiodra's Caster's escort. There's basically a bunch of guys who don't matter a whole too much uh, because spoiler alert, they're all going to get picked off. Red shirts. Slowly. Harry red shirts. <laughs> Harry red shirts. Indeed. Um, we do another little detail that, yeah, another little detail I like here um, is that we get a specific mention of Sangheili dialects um, that basically everyone still speaks Sangheili because that was the lingua franca among the Covenant and the Ex-Covenant. Um, but 
Gato Guy specifically uses old Sangheili to kind of piss off the brutes. Um, and he and Veda Lopez and the ferrets are below decks and they are sparring in this sort of, I'm not sure how much he knows, uh, thing that goes on for a while. Uh, and we get the whole background on ferret teams infiltration because in shadows of reach, they very much are not the main characters. They just show up, um, give Fred a message and leave. Um, so there's a, it's a previously on halo. This is the usual, um, info dump for in case somehow you are not a huge halo fan and ended up with this book. Uh, <laughs> you are not totally left, uh, in the dark that the ferret team is Veda Lopez and her three Spartan threes, uh, that they went deep cover. Um, and we actually get, uh, throughout, we get de- uh, some interesting wrinkles that they end up with the keepers of the one freedom, but they, en- they start out in like another cult, basically a doomsday cult before that. Um, and basically the, the problem that ferret team has is now in the post created world, they're cut off from UNSC support. And the big issue is that the Spartan threes don't have access to their meds. So soon they're going to be going uh, just crazy, basically, uh, once they get off it. Um, so it's it's there's a time crunch on this. And this entire book takes place basically over a weekend or like three days. Um, so it's a, it's a very compressed timeline. Uh, but as mentioned, they're about to get shot at. Um, and basically in the process of exiting the portal, uh, they end up with a UNSG pilot and a ship sort of inside the Lich, um, which is a cool little weird, uh, slip space shenanigans thing, uh, a short sword fighter pilot from spirit of fire. Ta-da. It kind of harkens back to those old, uh, the old Nyland books and talking about the weird stuff that could happen in slip space, but we never really, yeah usually didn't get to actually see. Mm -hmm. So on the arc, the Lich appears basically in the middle of a firefight. Um, We get an update on uh, what's been happening on the arc. And here we also get an update uh, on the events of the Sacrifice short story, which was a Walmart exclusive for Shadows of Reach uh, that when this book came out, 343 made freely available. You can grab the PDF. We'll put the link in the show notes. Um, But basically the wrinkle is that there were some loyal truthy covenant left behind on the Ark uh, who survived Halo's firing, which there's a lot of that going around on the Ark. (laughs) But uh, Caster talks with our, our our good friend, Let Valier from Halo Wars 2. Uh, and basically bluffs them. Uh, and there's some 3D chess moves done to get the banished off their back because the keepers are absolutely on their own and there's pretty much no chance that the banished won't go after them at some point. Um, and Caster, meanwhile, has Veda talk to the UNSC. Um, and, of course, because... He is out to set up the rings. He wants to immediately uh, join the Covenant. And together, they will get off to their sentient life blowing up ways. The other, one of the other perspectives we get throughout this book, which personally I really loved because while it had issues, I really like Halo Wars 2, is we get to check in with uh, Pavum and Vortis from Awakening the Nightmare. Um... And actually, I think this does a really good job of expanding on their characters, that they're both, they're really just, I guess, in some ways, too clever for their own good for Brutes. Uh, they're always getting into trouble. Um, they're, they're kind of simultaneously both idiots and geniuses. Yeah, and that's a nice thing, because in the, in the Awakening of the Nightmare, uh, what's it, Vorotus is the one who basically screws everything up and... and the entire rest of the DLC is just getting out of his mess. Uh, but we get to see both of them be clever uh, in this one. And uh, they were 
able to get Atriox to send a message back to the Milky Way. So that's basically how they survived uh, the Awakening of the Nightmare without Atriox killing them off is because they pulled some technical crazy stuff uh, how to do that. Um, and this ties into the slip space shards uh, from First Strike and that were later explained what they were in Renegades, I believe, um, that they were used to open the portal. Uh, so there is is a way without opening the portal at the other side to get off the ring. And so everyone's fighting about that because they all want it. Um, but the we do learn that despite saving their lives, uh, Pavim and Bordas' clan is not doing so hot. And there's a, they're basically trying to keep a, it doesn't really amount to much in this, but they're trying to keep a challenge from breaking out from one of their underlings. Um, so it's, it's an interesting wrinkle. It fortunately doesn't, they don't spend a huge amount of it on this book because it's not really a, it, I know some people were excited about going back to the arc, but in many ways, and I would say this is somewhat of a weakness is that halo wars two characters and stuff are really incidental to the book um for the most part they definitely don't just uh use them as a crutch or anything especially yeah. with especially since pavium and vordis are the most uh, significant ones and they really don't directly interact with anybody really yeah they're 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 kind of the third party in a lot of these scenes uh interacting but they aren't uh directly dealing with our main characters um, so the, the Lich crashes, the Keepers evacuate, uh, the Ferret team debate tactics. Uh, we do get, throughout this book, um, there is a lot of weird wildlife on the Ark, um, in a way that we haven't seen since the, I think, justly maligned, uh, <laughs> Peter David Halo novel, uh, Hunters in the Dark, but some people really love that book. I, I I do think I like that more than the uh, average Halo fan. <laughs> I know there are dozens. I mean, Haruspis will go to bat that he loves that book. Um, but I do like that we do. It's one of those things like it's an arc that's supposed to be a, a nature refuge, basically teeming with life. Uh, we get these uh, really interesting ones called Scratchers, which my thought with how they act in this book is that they should have been the a uh, hostile force in um, Nightfall versus the weird flying <laughs> Lacogal worms, hunter worms, because uh, these are really interesting that they like basically just burrow into people and pick them apart. It's not fun. Uh, they sound they sound terrifying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do, and they're like kind of like weird eye stalky things. Um, they sound really cool and. Uh, they're, they're, they don't spend a whole lot of time in here, but they're interesting. Um, and they're encircled by the wildlife, but they're saved by uh, the Covenant showing up. Um, and they're led by a prelate who we first got introduced as the sort of quasi-Spartans of the prophets. Uh, this guy's Das Basvad or something like that. Uh <laughs> Um, and that's actually one of the surprising, uh, elements of this book, I think, is that a long lingering plot thread is what exactly happened to the prophets. Uh, they've talked about like, are they basically extinct? What happened to the rest of them? Uh, shadow of intent, uh, the half jaw basically sets out to find some, um, and as it's going to turn out, uh, this guy has some details to spread on that. Um, we do get the name, uh, the covenant name for what happened is the War of Annihilation, which is interesting. And he's definitely trying to get back the pieces of the Foreigner Crystal. Uh, but Castor parlays with them. And here we get a nice drop in that intrepid eye of the sort of background antagonist uh, who's been running through a lot of uh, Halo, since uh, Last Light, is listening. One thing Denning really deserves credit for is actually 
demonstrating in a lot of ways how foreigner AIs can seem super advanced, um, which I don't think it's always been tough to, to, to convey, but he does a pretty good job with Intrepid Eye and the fact that she's everywhere. She basically sticks herself into uh, Das's staff to generate an image. Um, she's kept in all these pieces of the Keeper's armor. Um, at this point, I wrote a note that Intrepid's Eye's arc is basically the assembly from Halo Reach, except better, because it's much more interesting than a random, unrelated group of shadowy AIs controlling everything that doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> Uh, and the the nice little detail here is that Intrepid Eye at this point wants to fire the Halo um, because with Cortana taking over everything, it ruined all her plans. And so she wants to damage the domain again to stop Cortana, um, which I thought was an interesting little wrinkle. I, I definitely liked that being her plan because in like the, the six years we've had the debate like how they're how slash if they're gonna like deal with Cortana I know shutting off like the domain and uh it's definitely like one of those key theories that I've always thought about but I always thought that there would never be anybody stupid enough to uh fire the halos to do it yeah and it, it's one of those things that really works because she's not she's not crazy no because for her she's working like Cortana says working the long plan like if the universe has to get reseeded and stuff and life has to come back and humanity has to take the mantle in another hundred thousand years or whatever. That's totally fine. She just can't abide some uppity human AI ruining her plans, which is, 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 is this the first um, information we've gotten that like the arc has these repositories of genetics that like you're able, you'd be able to like completely repopulate a, a species from it. Um, I mean, I guess that was sort of implied by all the indexing, but I don't think it was really ever made clear that you s sort of could do it all over again. I, I thought the indexing thing was like, it wasn't ever indicated to be like a one-off, one-time deal or anything like, so it, it, it makes sense and it's compatible with what we already knew about it. Yeah. I'm kind of surprised that um, ba Basvod never talked about the profits, you know, using those repositories for themselves to kind of like help their population problems yeah, and throughout the book. I mean, as much as I think it sort of definitively closed off like what the prophets knew and when they knew it, I guess you can still say that maybe he really was about recreating the entire galaxy in his image. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so Intrepid Eye showing up means Ferret Team freaks out. And we get uh, the explanation of, or the in-universe explanation of why they don't link up with the UNSC. The out-of-universe explanation is this is their novel, uh, and they're the main <laughs> characters. Uh, but the in-universe explanation they give, um, they do leave a note on the uh, plot short needs swords. To happen. <laughs> yeah, they leave a note on the short sword crew member's corpse before they move out. Um, the banished arrive on the scene, uh, and they find. Veda's note because uh, they are the scratchers or whatever are basically tunneling through the ship and stripping out uh, stuff of worth. We also get uh, an explanation for why there are no humans left in the banished um, to sort of backfill explanations for why Atriox hates them because in Shadows of Reach that was a big thing I know lots of people were upset about was they, they talked about how Atriox hated humans and there weren't, they would get these humans out of my sight or we'll have to kill them, that kind of thing. Uh, but we learned that presumably after the Spirit of Fire beat the crap out of them, uh, a bunch of the humans in the Banished uh, defected or tried to defect. Um, and so they sort of redetail it that Atriox is fine with humans, Asharam, definitely not. And that a lot of the the uh, clans and stuff basically went up and killed uh, their humans to prevent them def defecting. So uh, that's that's why they're not around in the banished anymore. But uh, don't they also talk about that being a like contingency now that like the covenant are around? They don't want to leave any humans for them to activate the halos. Yeah, and that that comes into fact or uh, with this. Um, and there's a running thing is that well. You might hate the humans, but you need them. 
Uh, and so <laughs> there's a, a kind of running joke here where Basfod and, and uh, Das wants to kill off all the humans because he doesn't trust them or finds them annoying or later on that they're, they're traitors. Uh, and so they keep on pointing out, well, these guys are, are super fragile. Like you want to have spares, <laughs> like you don't just want to have one and try and get to the halo and they are proven right because they die off repeatedly. But, uh, the, they, everyone, the covenant powwows, um, we get up to speed. Uh, we get some, uh, name drops, caster name drops, some brutes that people remember before, uh, Lytus, uh, from Escalation gets mentioned or Hakawabe from Envoy. Uh, which is a nice little nod to continuity. Yeah. Uh, das wants to know if any of the Sans Hayum survived. Um, and here we get what's what's later confirmed, uh, but here is presented as a rumor that there was a flotilla of and of Sans Hayum uh, who managed to survive, and they headed to a Shield World cloister. And so we le- learn that Das does not believe. Uh, in the the great journey, but he's all about a great cleansing, uh, so he will activate the hills to do it. And the idea is that that way they will. Truth might have been a believer; he is not. He is going to wipe the galaxy clean, so the San Shayun can emerge from hiding and take over everything. Uh, so we learn truth was totally genuine, but this guy is sort of doing what people thought Truth's motivations in Halo Three might be. Um, so I I, th- I think one of the interesting things about this is um, if if you look at like how p- prophet characters have been shown in some other works like um, in Broken Circle uh, the Zoe Reskin character um, I, I think it's clear that like it's not like a unified San Chayum species conspiracy thing where all of them know that the religion's a lie it seems to be like an upper echelon thing and it Kind of seems like truth. I weirdly wasn't a part of that, almost. Yeah, well, it seems like especially that uh, truth had his plans, and there were people who were happy to for truth to be gone uh, and had their plans of their own. Um, <laughs> so uh, we do get an explanation for one thing that kind of bothered me with Halo Wars Two uh, visually was the fact that because it used. Uh, more three four threes Tron Runner look. There was a lot of stuff on the arc that didn't feel like it was on the arc because it looked like it could be any other installation, um, and that included the fact that there was some in the final battles. You're going to this control room where Anders is that looks nothing like the control room, uh, but we learned that the original Citadel from Halo Three doesn't exist anymore. It basically got destroyed and reconfigured. Um, and so that's why the the new one is in a more secure location. Um, but to find it, they have to head to a cartographer because they have all played Halo games before and they know the sequence. Um, and uh, we get, this is one of those things where there's the runner of, well, Ferret team tried to get them blown up. That didn't work. So they're gonna try and get the Covenant and Keepers to kill each other. Uh, that doesn't work either. Um, but they, they do reach, a uh, spirit of fire Pelican that's sort of hiding around. And in the classic, this is, I, I really want to believe that in 500 years in the future, if people still know Morse code, it's going to be entirely because of all the science fiction media that assumes that in the future people <laughs> will know Morse code, uh, because <laughs> they, uh, they send a message, uh, basically like painting the painting the pelican uh they sent a message in morse code explaining what's going on um we do get uh in the ensuing thing on the the journey to the cartographer we get an interesting bit about uh brute funeral rites that you basically either like have a big party and honor them with blood games and stuff like that or you toss them aside uh, which was interestingly utilitarian and very very much what you would expect from the Jiral Hane. We get uh we get introduced to the other human keepers who are left. Uh there's Quenby, Knox, and Ober. And these guys are not really characters except for serving as MacGuffins to keep track of. Um, but I do like that they 
they detail them a little bit. Um, like Quenby was in a human death cult that basically wasn't radical enough for her, so she joined the Keepers. Um, Albert was a xenobiologist who was just obsessed with the foreigners, and this was one of those ways to get get close to foreigner stuff. And then Knox is just basically a dumb kid. <laughs> He's the the like teenager runs off to join ISIS of Halo, basically. Um, oh God. <laughs> But unfortunately for them, Ferret Team is going to kill him off as soon as possible. Uh, we get more sparring between Gagodai and Veda. Um, and like, does he know or not? And we switch to his POV. And he definitely suspects a spy because game recognized game. He's a spy. He knows how spies operate. Um, and I do like that he's he's sort of the wild card throughout this book because he obviously doesn't want to destroy all life. Um, and so he's sort of torn whether he should reveal a uh, ally with the ferrets or not. And meanwhile, the ferrets are not sure if they should ally with him, um, which is a nice little detail. Uh, and he's he's really uh, iffy on on the whole galaxy destruction thing, but we do get his his tragic backstory um, with the the love of his life who he's separated from and comes back and she just doesn't care about him anymore. So he sort of wants to see everybody burn for that reason. Um, which is not the most original, uh, reason to try and burn everything down, but it's understandable. Bit of an, bit of an incel backstory. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, and I, I do like that. The, but the, the extra terrible part for him is that by the time he gets back, not only does his princess not care about him and doesn't need saving, but everyone he he plotted to take revenge on is already dead. Um, <laughs> so it's it's definitely a nice little. It's kind of tragically funny in a way. Uh, his whole backstory. Uh, we do get a detail. Here's where they bring up, "Hey, you need to have spare humans because you don't know what's going to happen." Uh, apparently, at some point, Das fought two Spartans. Uh, that gets mentioned. Um, I presume that is not the Spartans of Red Team in the Spirit of Fire, but it's not actually clarified under what circumstances this this fight occurred. There is a we get a lot more of the because obviously the four forerunner monitor who ran the arc has been destroyed, but there's lots of sub monitors throughout. Um, when they reach the the cartographer, there's the interface executor. Um, but they, they get directions to the Clarion, AKA the Citadel of which there are multiple sites on the arc. Um, they learn that the arc is still not back to basically full strength. Um, and so they've, they're conserving resources. For instance, they disabled the portals, uh, to explain why you have to hoof it for plot reasons. Um, and then uh ferret team split up because they don't trust them uh the banished show up uh the sentinels and the banished get into a fight uh the keepers lose a bunch of people we do have a uh interesting powwow with castor and gagodai who gagodai is really trying to make castor realize he's being an idiot um and i i think denning does deserve credit for making Castor really smart while also having him be an idiot about uh, lighting the halos the entire time. He's got a blind spot. <laughs> yeah, he's got a, a giant blind spot, but it's understandable and it doesn't <laughs> doesn't mean he's just a total idiot to buy into it. Um, and one thing that gets brought up, which is a nice little use of the fact that he's a, a main character in these series of books is he brings up all the other times he basically should have died, but somehow survived. Um, and uses that as like, well, obviously the gods are walking out for me. Cause how else do you explain this? Um, I, which I, I really nice love, I, I know that it's like a bad, a bad narrative device on paper to have a character just, you know, luck out and never die. But I kind of love that like caster is like a, an, almost an inverse of the master chief. And that he's really, mm-hmm. really lucky. But he, he's the character you don't want to be lucky. Yeah, and I think 
in a lot of ways, this is probably the closest Halo has gotten to something like Avengers Infinity War, where the bad guy is the one who has the major arc. Um, Because this is really, while it's not all told from Caster's perspective, it is really Caster's story throughout this. Um, Mm. And so Mm -hmm. you obviously don't want him to win, but you understand him uh, and you you sympathize and you still want to root for him to a degree. The Oracle pipes up uh, Intrepid Eye because, of course, she has figured out that their ferret team is among them. Uh, and Caster wants to just brutalize them. But, of course, Ghetto Guy is like, wait, we should be stealthy. I really did like this part because just because Intrepid Eye talks about, like, yeah, do you realize how un- statistically improbable it is that they would have avoided cameras? Even though, like, avoiding cameras seems like the smart thing to do. It's like one of those, they were already going to be screwed regardless. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, there's no... And so, like, Veda is left with, like, well, have they figured out uh, we are compromised or yet? Um, and this leads into the everyone is double-crossing everyone else section of the book, where uh, they lay out this plan of, oh, well, we got to dig through this ice to reach the control room and all this stuff, and everyone is eavesdropping on everyone else. <laughs> and uh, they're so... Like, for instance, Vorotus and Pavium are listening in and they realize, once again, here, uh, Vorotus gets his his point to be smart and he realizes that it's totally a ruse. Um, and so Pavium comes with a plan. The The ferrets reunite and they go scouting, but they, they figure out at this point uh, they're probably, their cover is blown and how they're going to be uh, ambushed. Uh, we get this kind of weird sequence where once again the wildlife shows up and it basically steals all of ferret team's stuff but uh they they decide the covenant decide that they're gonna just bomb them uh, and then depart for the the citadel um dos spends time getting in the head of krellis because he's already scheming to basically get rid of caster but they do not kill off the ferrets and in fact the ferrets immediately turn around and launch an attack on the covenant before they leave uh and they kill off everyone except for Quenby, uh, who they, there's actually a, a nice little touch here is that uh, they don't know uh, which of the humans has a Gaosh and can actually uh, activate the, the halo except for Quenby did it previously. So that's the person left alive and they're like, oh crap. Um, but they do have a nice uh, a touch that Obviously, the Spartans are in super serious danger. They're running out of their meds. They're running out of time. But Veda is just happy not to be hiding anymore, not to be playing a role after years of cover, uh, which she can understand. And uh, the UNSC arrive. There's there's some back and forth with the UNSC, um, with Veda explore, informing them about the state of the galaxy and realizing how far out of the loop they are. Um there's a nice detail that it's just nice to have people surprised by Spartans again. Uh, That's one thing that came out of this is that you're used to now, especially that everyone there's hundreds of Spartans and they're running around and it's not that interesting. Uh, We get some, some details with the the Spartans. I would say one, one uh, weakness of this story is that it really doesn't. And I think this is always a problem with all the books is that, it's tough to get a real handle on the characterizations of the Spartans um, and Ferret Team, especially. They don't. There's not a lot of time spent with them in this book, and like getting more of their personalities. That's one of my main my main complaints about the story was the the focus on Ferret Team just didn't seem to be satisfying. Like at any point in the book, I I didn't feel as if I was getting what I wanted from their perspective. Hmm. I can I I can agree with that also. Um, I personally was. I'll, I'll be honest. I'm not the I'm not the the biggest fan of uh, the the uh, Spartan threes on the ferrets. I mean, I'm not 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 that I dislike them or anything, but uh, 
I was fine with their perspective, um, but it, I mean, it's an undeniable that it's always supplanted by Veda being the POV character for them instead of any of the mm-hmm. threes. Yeah, but we do get a little bit of stuff here. Like, for instance, Mark, uh, like he obviously kills the people he had to kill because they necessary, but he still feels bad about killing who were until that moment, their former friends. Um, and yeah, so, at least at least there's some human slice to that because you've been hanging around these people for years, day in, day out. You would feel a wee bit bad, a wee bit. I do. I did like that part a bit. I I do think it's a little um, undercut just because you don't get really a sense for how Veda and the ferrets got got along with like the keepers day to day. Like they talk mm-hmm. about it a couple of yeah. offhanded times, but I think it might have been served if they had like you know a brute or another human that they actually got along with a lot. Mm-hmm. And it's, we never get to see like an actual scene of just normal interaction between them, like. Mm-hmm. They're just right. we're just told about it after the fact, right? Um, the UNSC take a bunch of vultures to deal with the Covenant, um, and then we learn that they were had basically that they sent them and they destroyed some banished instead of the Covenant. Uh, there's another weird like watcher in the water kind of moment with some tentacled wildlife that pops up. Uh, some more more wheel or weird alien arc shenanigans. Uh, meanwhile, Pavlov and Vordas were ambushed by the Covenant. The the little side plot about, oh, is there going to be a challenge to the leadership gets resolved because their usurper has no choice but to rescue them from the problem. Otherwise, uh, basically the rest of the clan would think that he like deliberately killed them and lose honor and prestige that way. Um, so at this point, the Spirit of Fire transmits the location of the Citadel and the clear because they, someone needs to try and stop them. Uh, and so here we're in the point where everyone is gunning for it. Uh, no one's really allied with each other, but they're all trying to stop the Covenant uh, and the Keepers who uh, approach the Citadel. Uh, and I like here Intrepid gives them crap for once again not having played their copies of Halo 3 and knowing that there are tower defenses around the Citadel that they have to drop before they can reach it. Uh, which is a nice little touch to stuff we've seen in the games. Um, but uh, basically they have the banished hole up around the Citadel. Uh, the fair team and stuff arrive. Uh, they're all these Spartan threes are going off their smoothers, so they're starting to show the effects. Uh, they decide they have to make kill the last keeper, Quenby, and that will force Caster to come to them uh, because then they'll need a human. Uh, they do a there's a a nice little touch. Once again, we're talking about not a whole lot of of ferret team character moments, but here they're doing uh, this breathing exercise, like meditation. They learned during their their days undercover in cults, uh, which I liked. Um, but then this entire, this leads to the final like bit of the book where it's extended action sequences over time. So they they kill Quenby, Mark severely hurt. They, they jump to Intrepid who is, and this is the interesting thing where it's as much her plans unraveling uh, throughout this book because as more people die she loses capabilities and so she decides that her solution is to jump into the arcs network they convince the sub monitor at the the citadel to extend a bridge for them across and send some sentinels to support the fight uh and veda determines at this point that they also need to kill intrepid eye so she plans on getting captured and Gato guy indeed grabs her. Uh, at this point, basically, it's the the keepers and covenant are down to caster like three other brutes, uh, Gato guy and uh, the prelit. Um, and we learn that Krellis in fact betrayed him to the prelit, but he doesn't end up killing him. Uh, meanwhile, <laughs> Pavum and Voridus basically just cannot catch a break because they end up 
uh, under a massive assault of Sentinels that they can't do anything about. I, I, I really liked that um, that that bit highlighted one of the shortcomings of like Pavium, like because he was berating himself, like obviously the the Forerunner defenses would attack us, and I was thinking, mm. yeah, you probably should have seen that coming. <laughs> Yeah, like especially after it like destroyed your flagships and stuff like that. You guys should know better. But they're they're a little too smart for their own good and and a little too hasty. Um but at this point uh we get some explanation basically of what Intrepid's status is and this leads into their plan to have the Spirit of Fire shell the Citadel with Mac rounds because once Intrepid's in the system they destroy her there she's gone for good and obviously if the control room is destroyed that removes the the whole problem of starting the halo um they are forced to leave mark behind because he's he's injured uh so inside the citadel it's not the final the final countdown but caster's got the blues because he's he's thinking about wow like everybody's dead this is terrible um i'm not sure it was totally worth it um the banished attack and uh Krellis gets to do his his best get down mr president uh, and saves caster <laughs> they end up uh <laughs> they pavum and vorda show up and they they quickly get chucked off the edge of a cliff and it really felt like a team rocket is blasting off again moment where like <laughs> all right we can't kill you off but we need you out of here like your role is played in this story so bing off they go we do get uh, a nice little touch, though, because Krellis is mortally wounded, but Caster tasks him with letting him know when the ferrets arrive. Um, he's basically like, just stay alive for long enough when you regain honor or whatever, all that stuff. Um, Gadugai and Caster and Veta uh, have this talk. They're like, hey, like maybe we should just kill the prelate and call this whole thing off. Um because they're at the control room and this is this is sort of the the thing and Veda does get a lot of like her her attempts to destroy every themselves or stall are pretty impressive throughout this book uh she even uh tries to tell the sub monitor that the intrepid eye has the logic plague uh so don't do anything she says um and so that forces intrepid eye to basically captain kirk the the sub monitor um, or maybe, I guess the uh, uh, reference people might more understand is it's kind of like Inception, the sub-monitor, by like planting a, a subroutine into it um, to basically backdoor into the system. I like that there was the worm that she had was uh, something she got from her fights with Cortana. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was really cool. Uh, and then, of course, once Intrepid is in, uh, they call for the, the orbital strike. They're... they're trap has been sprung as it were so at this point everyone's doing pretty badly mark is outside playing cat and mouse with a sentinel um he basically just chucks something at it and basically survives that way olivia and ash take serious hits inside uh and then uh caster finally has enough of the the prelate after all this time he he decides to kill him in the most Star Wars way possible by picking him up and chucking him down the shaft of the control room. <laughs> he was not not saying no at the same time, but, you know. Uh, and everyone decides at that point, let's call it a day and bug out um, before the next max round hits and Intrepid Eye gets left to die which is uh, a quiet little sad end, but I'm glad it was one of those things that, like I said, the, the assembly was kind of terrible because it was having this weird shadowy AIs controlling everything behind the scenes, which is not fun. Uh, but Intrepid was a natural character, so it wasn't as annoying, but it was always a loose end that I felt like you had to wrap up sooner rather than later. So I'm glad they did. So, so do you think that she is actually dead? I would say so. I feel like in many ways this feels like they're wrapping up a bunch of stuff uh, that they left unaddressed while they're then laying sort of the seeds for where they're going to go from here. Um, I don't know. It's obviously it's 
in any media, someone's not dead until they're dead, 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 and they can still come back. But I think she's probably gone. Yeah, what's the what's the rule? Like until you see a body, and even then, and then mm-hmm. <laughs> a body just means you can resurrect them through zombie magic. Uh, <laughs> um, and then uh, so that sort of resets everything, status quo. Pavum and uh, Vordis keep doing their brotherly bickering. Um, and I think, honestly, they are as minor a role as they play. They're probably the best characterization in the entire book for me. I I, I think they're the most fun. Because it absolutely rings true with what they were in Awakening the Nightmare. Yeah, and they're they're kind of vaguely comic relief um, in, a, in a serious way, if that makes sense. But they're just a lot of fun, and it takes... Well, I mean, they have, like three minutes of cutscene dialogue and then stuff in the missions. There's there's not much of them in the game, uh, but they really, uh, Denning does a great job of furthering their characterization and making them sound exactly like they did. Um, so the final Mac round wipes out the Citadel uh, and, and Pavum and Vortis basically decide like, well, we can spin this as our clan was the reason this was a huge success. And, you know, like, okay. Um, and then we get to the point where I absolutely was surprised because the prelate survived getting chucked down a shaft, which, okay, I can buy that. But then uh, they come across and he just up and snaps Mark's neck and kills him. Uh which I did not, I did not expect. I was really thinking everyone was going to get out of this alive, especially after they had, they had dealt with the the major threat. Um, I I was wondering ever since Mark got stabbed by Caster's Ravager if he was going to die in this book or not. So I I was definitely like, oh, they are doing it. Yeah, and I think once again the weakness here is there was not a lot to make him into a, a serious character, at least in this book. If you went back and reread all of them you might get more out of it but um still it's it's appreciated that i think the most you could get out by going back through the old ones is that like mark was always the one like in last light that veda thought was going to be the killer so he kind of had slightly more tension than like ash and olivia but yeah that's that's i'll admit that's reaching i mean he was definitely if you were going to kill one of them he was seems like the obvious one in retrospect um but we also, uh, like before, we learn the full scope of uh, the prelate's plans because he's after the foreigner, the slip space crystals. And we learn um, that he's been in contact with the other San Shayum uh, who are hanging out on Cloister. And basically he's decided, all right, we can't hide anymore, but we're going to have to take the universe back by force. Um, so, dun, dun, dun. Here comes our, our new enemy. Um, uh, and everyone else, meanwhile, gets picked up, uh, we get, uh, they have the, the through line is that they have a line that the Ash gives about how Veda's, uh, their mother and all the way that counts, aw, maternal love, f- found family, etc. Uh, whereas, uh, Got a guy and Caster are talking, and Caster is now motivated solely by revenge. So we'll see what he ends up doing. And then finally, there's an epilogue, which finally takes place on the Spirit of Fire. Everyone's back um, in healing, and I appreciate that they mention that, yeah, the Spirit of Fire can't just immediately replicate the crazy cocktail of medications that the spartan threes take because they aren't a unsc facility with deep hospital like records or access to whatever crazy stuff um but everyone's doing fine and there's the uh funeral for the random spirit of fire guy who got killed earlier and mark we briefly see uh cutter and red team pop up so hey there's your your Wink and a nod to Halo Wars too. Um, is it just is it just me or did Alice seem like Alice kind of seemed like really really like just straight up mean in her encounter with uh, the the ferrets? Oh, uh, she was. <laughs> Come on. Uh, yeah, I don't know. 
I'm just not used to those little Spartans, I guess. Um, there is uh, an interesting little bit that this is the first uh, Halo book, I think, that has like a, a full-on postscript uh, from 343 about the pandemic in Halo, which I thought was interesting. Um, and also interesting is that they rearranged, they have a a full list of all the books that they've rearranged into stuff. So now, for instance, the Ferret Team books are together. Um, the Foreigner Saga and Kilo 5 stuff were already established. Um, we got the, the Denning verse stuff gets broken into its own section, um, which is just interesting in a cataloging sort of way. There's uh, there's one we note here I, I made, and I, I didn't see it covered in our wee uh, overview, and that's the uh, the moment, well, one of the moments where Veda is being carried like a handbag. Uh, one of the, uh, yeah, what was it? Someone said it was uh, the game of tossers, or the brute oh, game yeah. of tossers using her body. I thought that was an interesting wee note. Yeah, it it reminded me a little of uh, there was between that and the the blood games. Uh, it reminded me a little of the stuff we get in um, stomping on the heels of a fuss, the short story in Halo Evolutions, where they show oh. just these renegade brutes. Just yeah, they're they're absolutely awful. I think Tossers has been mentioned before. I, cu- I couldn't tell you where, though. First mentioned in Halo Retribution, mentioned in Silent Storm, and mentioned in Divine Wind, which is a definitely... Uh, it's I an think, ongoing game of Tossers, then. <laughs> I think that's definitely, I guess, one of the advantages of having Denning A doing most of the books, and there's there's clearly some interplay between him and uh, Gay because they, they do a good job of referencing each other's stuff, and keeping little tiny things uh, mentioned here and there. Um, keep that, that narrative connective, that connectivity. Um, so yeah, that's, that's uh, the story, you know, divine wind. I think overall I was positive. Danny, not so positive, but I think it's definitely. I, I didn't say it was a good book by Halo standards. Come on. Give me some credit. Damning with faintest praise. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, so I definitely feel like I was saying that this closes out, um, I wouldn't say it closes the, the characters' arcs entirely, but it closes out a major chapter of them, like when Castor or Gagadai or uh, the, the prelate uh, come back, it'll be really sort of the beginning of another story. Um, I don't know if we'll get another fair team book after this, or they'll... I'm very interested to see what Castor and Gadded Guy are going to do. It's just like two random mm-hmm. people on the arc. Yeah, I, I get that they're sort of the, got this odd couple thing. I would love to come them to come back. Um, and I'm not sure. I'm sure we'll see on an infant time scale. Certainly we'll see Ferret Team again. Maybe they won't be in their own book. Um, maybe they'll appear somewhere else. But um, certainly going to get it. And I'm excited to have the San Shayum back. Um I hope they aren't all evil, uh, because as we were talking about earlier, it's it nice to have them be like unique and human-like in their variety of motivations and beliefs. But I think they could also be an interesting, uh, another potential enemy in the future. Yeah, I definitely think the Sanchayum ads are, I think the Sanchayum stuff is some of the most um, relevant potentially to like future Halo stories since a lot of the rest- I, of I think we're, we sat here and talked- I think we sat here and talked about this, where about the sign should possibly be coming back like a decade ago. Just bring them back or just tell them to f*** off permanently at this point. Like, come on, get with it. Come on. They left that little plot thread all the way back in um, Glasslands, I think. Karen Travis's Glasslands. Mm-hmm. They left a little detail about how the Sanchayum seemed to have disappeared and took most of the engineers with them. Um, yep. So yeah, it's it has been a decade actually. Exactly. So yep. it'll be nice to, <laughs> to see that maybe follow oh, up. Stop. Yeah. Oh stop making me right. feel old. <laughs> <laughs> oh well we're all old now. Uh all right, so any last thoughts before we close this out? The, I, I think one of the reasons I do like this is I always really appreciate when you get like the villain or antagonist perspectives in books, but I also like really appreciate when like the friction comes not just from like the heroes and the villains, but like the villains also like competing for the against each other. And I think I appreciated the uh, the interplay of 
Lancaster and the Keepers and the Prelate and the Covenant and then Pavium and Vortis in the mix. And I, re- mm-hmm. I, I, I just enjoyed seeing that play out. I think yeah. that's probably it's my... It's definitely more fun. Yeah, I think that's probably like the biggest thing I enjoyed out of the book. Um, but yeah, overall, it's pretty good. I don't know where I would necessarily rank it in terms of every Halo book. Um, in terms of Denning's Halo books, it might be my second favorite under Silent Storm, probably. That's about the as detailed of a ranking mm. as I could give you. Yeah, I, I try not to. I usually just put them in buckets instead of trying to sequentially order them, but we'll see. I guess it will really depend on... Because it is definitely tough because you rank them on how much you like the book itself, but it's also how much stuff gets followed up on or whatever later on that, that impacts it too. How important the book is, really. Um I wanted to try and draw some parallels between the, the general feeling of the book and um, the, draw some parallels to, to Halo Infinite, actually. Oh. Because you have a generic Halo landscape, generic forces spread out fighting and forcing each other, and that's, that's pretty much the setup for Halo Infinite, isn't that? Of course, mm-hmm. Ark and Zeta Halo are different, yes, but the, the, the thing remains that you're there's, there's fighting going on in this Forerunner installation, you're rushing across the map, doing good guy stuff, and that's basically what happens in this book. And I just thought that was a very interesting parallel. Mm-hmm. It's definitely, I think you can say to some degree, while this isn't obviously as intended to be as newbie friendly as the Denning Master Chief story stuff, it's definitely in some ways a very simple setup and much of the complication just comes from the interplay of the characters and factions. Um, well, I, 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 I just want to make clear that uh, unless you're a hardcore Halo fan, this book is impenetrable. Like this book is a confusing mess of all kinds of crap. If you don't know exactly what what's going on as you go in, like there's oh, yeah. nothing this book does it's, to help you up. It's what like bet. the third slash fourth book in a series you're not going to pick this up and really yeah oh hell no yeah go and go back and read last light which i thought was fine then read retribution Mm -hmm. which i thought was better and then you can read this which danny didn't like uh or liked fine asterisk (laughs) for a halo book (laughs) all right that wraps it up for this show uh thanks for joining us deaf guru Show notes and link to the episode, as well as articles and more, can be found on our website, fordatodon.com. You can subscribe to the podcast via iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or Stitcher. Check out our videos at YouTube at youtube.com slash fordatodon, or follow us on Twitter for updates on all our content at Forward Dawn. Thanks for listening, and see you next time. <laughs>